Welcome to lecture number three, Constitutional Economics and Constitutional Money. On the topic of constitutional economics, I figure there's really three lectures that could be done under this topic. Unfortunately, in this lecture series, we have time to do one, and I feel probably the most important one. The other two, we could go into what is true free market economics, Keynesian economic theory versus the Austrian School of Economics or free market economics. There are many good books on that topic. I'll recommend some toward the end here. But in addition to that, we could also explore the effects of government regulation and taxation and the ability to use our natural resources versus not and how that affects our economy. But the one I feel is probably the least understood is what is constitutional money? I find that many within the freedom movement are a little bit unclear on that topic, so I feel it's a, a great place to begin. Now, first of all, I want to demonstrate the power of our Constitution, in particular of constitutional money. Back in 1787, when the U.S. Constitution was written, our nation was in a very dire circumstance. Our public debt was at an all-time high and growing. Our states had literally begun taking up arms against states, fighting against each other over trade disputes. We were in a serious crisis that our nation, this free experiment of self-government, was about to crumble. The nations of France and Great Britain in particular were waiting in the wings, just fully expecting that we would collapse under our own self-government, under the Articles of Confederation. We had that graph on the board, on the video, where it showed on this side, 0% government anarchy, and the wedge went all the way up to 100% government tyranny on the other side. And somewhere in the middle was the proper balance of not too much government to harm the people, but enough government to protect their rights, which is where the U.S. Constitution was. The Articles of Confederation, on the other hand, were probably a little too close to the anarchy side. We had given our central government, Congress, certain tasks, certain duties that they needed to perform, and we did not give them the power to do them. For example, executing a war for our independence. They were given the obligation to, to run this war, to fund the war, and yet they had no taxing power. How do you fight a war without raising money to pay for the war? Well, what they ended up doing was printing money. They could ask the states, would you please send some taxes? And if the states raised more taxes than they spent, they might send some. It didn't work very well. And so they kept printing the continental dollar. And the continental dollar was so overprinted that it became worthless. Some of you might be familiar with the phrase, not worth a continental. It doesn't refer to the automobile. It refers to the money. That if you want to say something was totally worthless, that's not even worth a continental. It's worth less than our money, which was worthless. That gives you some idea of the circumstances of 1787. Now, George Washington here starts us off with a great quote in 1787, prior to the Constitution Convention coming together. He says, if any person had told me that there would have been such a formidable rebellion as exists, I would have thought him fit for a madhouse. What he's saying here is, if someone had told me ahead of time that once we won our independence from Great Britain, that we would have such chaos, I would have thought he was crazy. Surely it wouldn't be that bad, but it was. Now I point this out, 1787 in September, September 17th, the U.S. Constitution was signed and then sent out to the states. So that is Constitution Day, probably the most unknown holiday in our nation, Constitution Day, September 17th. Just two years later, 1789, we were living under the Constitution. George Washington had been sworn in now as our first president under the Constitution. From 1789 to the next quote, 1791, we have a two-year span of living under the Constitution. Notice how different his statement becomes, just two years of living under the Constitution. He now says, tranquility reigns. Our public credit stands on that high ground, which three years ago, it would have been considered a species of madness to have foretold. That's kind of the same statement he said before, only in reverse now. If you had told me ahead of time how prosperous and peaceful our nation would become in just two years of living under the Constitution, I would have thought you're crazy. There's no way they would have ever dreamt it. To me, this is the best economic stimulus package you could 
design. Let's start living under the Constitution again. It did a marvelous job taking us from what was probably equally as bad as the Great Depression of the 1930s. In the 1780s, it was probably very similar. And just two years completely turned it around in a way they never would have dreamt. Now again, I want to go back to a quote that we used in previous lecture, lecture number two. Thomas Jefferson giving us a guideline of how strictly we must adhere to the Constitution. He says, to take a single step beyond the boundaries thus specially drawn around the powers of Congress is to take possession of a boundless field of power, not longer susceptible of any definition. What he's saying is, if we can justify Congress taking one step outside the bounds of the Constitution, by that same justification we can justify two steps, and twenty, and a thousand, and a million. There is nowhere to logically limit them. So as we approach constitutional money, you'll notice that we do very strictly adhere to what the Constitution actually says. And it becomes very clear what our monetary policy is supposed to be. The first question we have to ask is, what is money? You've all heard of money. You've probably all used money. Throughout the history of mankind, many different things have been used as money. Shells have been used, cows, fish have all been used as money. Salt has been used as money. In fact, it's from the use of salt that we have the term salary and the phrase not worth his salt, meaning not worth his pay. But what we found is that there are certain traits that are best in what we use for money. The shells tend to be a little fragile. The fish, well, you always want fresh fish, right? You can't store it and store your wealth. In fact, here's a list of five things. The first one is, to use something as money, it's best if it has intrinsic worth. It was already worth something before we decided to use it as money. Next, if it's divisible. A cow, for example, isn't very divisible unless you're butchering the thing. Otherwise, the moment you start butchering it, you've lost the ability to breed it or to milk it. It's not very divisible. If I have a cow and I want some eggs, I can't just cut off its tail and trade it, right? The next one, portable. It's very helpful to be able to bring your money with you to the marketplace. And if it's very heavy or voluminous, that makes it more difficult. Durability. The shells, for example, fail on that regard. You don't want to put one of those in your pocket for fear you might lean against it or sit on it. And then lastly is relative scarcity. If, for example, we were to use sand as money, the portability becomes an issue, but the relative scarcity is a big one. How many truckloads of sand would it take to buy a home? So the relative scarcity makes it so that a very small unit can be exchanged for a large amounts of goods. And just naturally, without government intervention of any kind, we've naturally arrived at the precious metals as being the best fitting of these five conditions, gold and silver particularly. Now, question here. What is a dollar? Some of you might be familiar with what a dollar is. Does anyone have a $20 bill with them? If I were to borrow a $20 bill from you, we'll just put one up here on the board just to demonstrate. Let's say I, I borrow a $20 bill from you. Would it be a fair exchange for me to, instead of giving you back your 20, I give you back $1? Who's getting the better deal here? Well, the real answer is that depends on what the dollar is. Because if I give you this dollar in exchange for it, this is a silver dollar, true silver. And its current market value is quite a bit more than the $20 bill here. If you were to melt the coin down on current market, it's right around $35, plus the coin value adds a few dollars. So it might buy, you might be able to buy one of those coins for about $37, $38. So $1 is greater than 20, right? You remember those little greater than, less than questions in math? One is greater than 20. Got it? Now, if on the other hand, I were to, instead of giving you back your $20 bill, I were to give you instead a $100 trillion bill. Again, who's getting the better deal? Depends on what dollar we're talking about. In this case, I'm talking about the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe, and this is a tr true $100 trillion bill. That's enough to pay off our entire national debt and future obligations to Social Security. And what's it worth? 
when this was in circulation, if you spent it quickly, you might be able to get a loaf of bread for it. For $100 trillion, it's currently out of circulation, but on eBay you can pick them up for about two or three US dollars. Which one's worth more? One is greater than 20, and 20 is greater than 100 trillion. In fact, one is greater than both of these combined. Kind of confusing, isn't it? And you wonder why our children can't do math when you say that one is greater than 20 and 20 is greater than 100 trillion. But this just shows the difference in amount of money in circulation. They overprinted the Zimbabwe money and it became worthless, very much like the continental dollar. Now, to actually get into the Constitution, as we go to Article 1, Section 8, let's read a little bit about what the Constitution says about money. Article 1, Section 8, and under Section 8, we'll go to Clause 5. Clause 5 starts off with two coin money. Now, it should be noted, every one of the clauses in Article 1, Section 8 start with two, do this, and two, do that. Except the first one says the Congress shall have power to. So just remember to insert the Congress shall have power to in front of each of these additional phrases. So Clause 5 should read, the Congress shall have power to coin money. You see that there? It also says to regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin and fix the standard of weights and measures. Let's go ahead and take these in reverse. The last one first, Congress has the power to fix the standard of weights and measures. That one's very uncontroversial. Very simply, Congress sets up a standard of trade so that 50 pounds of wheat from one state is the same quantity as 50 pounds of wheat from another and so on that we'll have across our entire country uniform measurements for trade. Very simple. This next one, Congress has the power to regulate the value of foreign coin. I find this one kind of curious. Does Congress have the power to tell France what their coinage is supposed to be? Well, of course not. So what can they do? Congress can look around the world to other coin, such as this one. This is what's known as the Spanish pieces of eight. And notice how it's been divided in half and fourths and eighths. Congress can look around the world and find good gold and silver coin that they find is of consistent content and purity. And they can integrate it into our currency. And they did that with the Spanish pieces of eight, also known as the Spanish mill dollar. This Spanish coin was the Spanish dollar. That's where we got our dollar from, actually. They said, with the Coinage Act of 1792, that a US dollar is equal to the Spanish dollar, which they later determined was, by gathering a bunch of Spanish dollars together, they melted them down, determined what the content of silver was in a Spanish dollar, and said it has 371.25 grains of fine silver. The Coinage Act of 1792 defined a US dollar as 371.25 grains of fine silver derived from the Spanish coin, which was already in circulation in the United States. So that's the power over foreign coin. We can integrate that coin into our circulation. And by the way, some of the phrases that we're still familiar with come from that as well, such as here we have the Spanish pieces of eight divided in half, fourths, and eighths. Two eighths, right here, this quarter, is also known as two bits. You've all heard of two bits being a monetary term. That comes from the Spanish pieces of eight, which was often broken into halves, fourths, and eighths to make it more divisible, if you want to make small change out of your dollar. Very interesting. Now the next part, Congress having the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. The regulating the value thereof, again in the Coinage Act of 1792, Congress said that a US dollar is equal to this much, 371.25 grains of fine silver, and that a US silver dollar shall consist of that much silver alloyed with a certain percentage of copper. And that the gold coins would be alloyed with a certain amount of silver and a certain amount of copper. And they determined that we'd have a dollar coin and a 50 cent coin and a, a 25 cent coin, a quarter, and so on. So they delineated what our coinage would be. That's all under the regulate the value thereof power. Then the coin money power. Congress shall have the power to coin money. They established mints around the country to coin our money. We could bring in our gold and silver bullion and they would turn it into official US coins. In fact, they felt that the, uh, the coins and the value of the coin must be very protected. They put very stiff penalties. If any of the workers in the US mint were caught 
skimping on the amount of silver put into a coin or the amount of gold put into a coin. They said that the penalty for being caught doing that or the penalty for making fraudulent coins, if I'm a counterfeiter, for example, the penalty for both of those crimes would be death. So they took this pretty seriously. The protection of the value of our money they took very seriously, and we'll demonstrate why in a moment. I want to focus a little bit more on this coin money phrase because it appears twice in the Constitution. We have to read both of them side by side to properly understand it. The next one comes up in Article 1, Section 10. Section 10 of the U.S. Constitution consists of three clauses. Each one of them begins with the phrase, no state shall, and then there's a list of things that states shall not do. We'll be in the first clause here. So Article 1, Section 10, Clause 1. It starts off with no state shall, and then I'm skipping over to two lines later. You'll see where it says coin money. That's the only part we have time to go into is that line. No state shall coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in a payment of debts. First one first. No state shall coin money. Congress shall have power to coin money. I think that's pretty clear, isn't it? Who can coin money? Well, Congress. No state can coin money, only Congress can coin money. Very clear. Not a lot of confusion there. The next one says that no state shall emit bills of credit or make anything but gold and silver coin a tender payment of debts. Is there any state that is making nothing but gold and silver coin tender in payment of debts? No state that will accept anything but gold and silver coin. There is no state that's doing that today, is there? There's no state abiding by that clause in the Constitution. They are accepting things other than gold and silver coin. In, case, in most cases, they're accepting nothing but something other than gold and silver coin for paying of your taxes and such things. Now let's go to the middle one. Emit bills of credit. No state shall emit bills of credit. What does it say about Congress emitting bills of credit? I won't take the time to read the entire Constitution with you. It says nothing. The word emit bills of credit doesn't appear anywhere else in the Constitution. They don't have the power given to Congress. Now they did talk about it. In 1787, they looked at the Articles of Confederation and found this line. It says, Congress should have the power to borrow money or emit bills, speaking of bills of credit, on the credit of the United States. And they decided, let's propose to adopt that line into the new Constitution. So this was brought before the floor and they discussed this back and forth. This should be Article 1, Section 8, Clause 2. But if you look at Clause 2, you'll notice that this phrase, emit bills, is missing. They voted it down, quite strongly, actually. They decided that the power to emit bills was a dangerous power. It had led to the massive inflation of the continental dollar. What is a bill of credit, then? It's paper money. A bill of credit literally means that you have deposited a certain amount of gold or silver, something of true value, and you now have a receipt, a bill, saying you have a certain amount of credit at the local bank. That's what a bill of credit is. And the original gold certificates and silver certificates said on them that this bill is redeemable in its face value in gold or silver. You could take your $100 gold certificate and go in and get $100 worth of gold with it. It was redeemable in gold, and therefore it was as good as gold. But because they chose to remove that clause, the power to emit bills was never given to the federal and was forbidden to the states. Now remember the Tenth Amendment where it says the power is not delegated by this Constitution to the federal government, nor prohibited by it to the states. Well, this is a power that was not given to the federal and was prohibited to, it, uh, to the states by it. So who does that leave as having the power to emit bills of credit? The rest of the powers are reserved to the people, right? According to the Tenth Amendment. So the power to emit bills is forbidden to states, never given to the federal, it is reserved to us. We, the people, can trade in whatever we want to. I can trade a bunch of eggs for a side of beef or for an IOU. I could write you a piece of paper saying, I owe you for this side of beef. And that would essentially be a bill of credit there, wouldn't it? We, the people, are free to exchange in whatever we want. But government, state, can only use gold and silver for their exchanges and the federal can only create coin. 
not bills of credit. What is coin? Gold and silver. And that was it. So what is constitutional money? Gold and silver coin. And that is all. They never had the power to emit bills to create paper money. Speaking of this, in Federalist number 44, James Madison points out, the extension of the prohibition of bills of credit, paper money, must give pleasure to every citizen in proportion to his love of justice and his knowledge of the true springs of public prosperity. What he's saying is, as much as you understand where prosperity comes from, to that same degree you will love that we prohibited paper money. If you don't understand it, you might not appreciate this, but if you really know where prosperity comes from, you'll love that we prohibited paper money. Very strong statement. Now, so we did originally start out with gold and silver as our currency, as our money. And historically, it has always degraded in this manner that people go in to deposit their gold and silver at the local bank, and the bank gives you a certificate of ownership that you own gold on deposit at that bank, known as a, now, gold certificate, paper money, bill of credit. One of the reasons why they prohibited paper money was even when it's backed by gold like this, it's not long before the bankers recognize that when we deposit our gold, it's more convenient just to exchange in the paper. So we tend to buy and sell with the paper and never go pick up our gold. And they become very comfortable that at least 90% of the gold that's deposited never gets touched. No one comes in to pick it up. And no one would know the difference if it's there or not. Now there's that 10% that's constantly going in and out. So we better have at least that much. That means we could put out more bills of credit than we have gold to back it. And they quickly do so and make themselves rich in the process. And that's exactly what always happens with paper money. There's never been in the history of mankind a time when we created paper money backed by gold that didn't eventually inflate by expanding the paper money to exceed the amount of gold to back it. They've never found a way to stop it. Now where we are today, we've abandoned the gold certificates even. Notice that little gold certificate seal there next to Franklin. Whereas down here we just have a Federal Reserve seal and instead of it giving a promise that it's redeemable in gold, it just simply says this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, redeemable in nothing. That one's redeemable in 520s <laughs> or 10, $10 bills or whatever your change you want. But that's it. So to apply some terms to each of these, the top one, gold and silver coins, is commodity money. It's a commodity. It has value. Whether or not we're using it as money, it has intrinsic worth already. The second term, fiduciary money, specifically bills of credit. That is paper money backed by something. And what gives this one value? The fact that it's a promise to pay in something of real value. That's what gives the fiduciary money its value. Now this last one, which is backed by nothing but fiat. Fiat money doesn't, like I once thought, does not mean fake. Fiat means law or dictate. What gives this last one its value is a law saying that you must accept it for payment of debts. It is the law that gives it value. And other than that law that says you must accept this piece of paper as real money, what is the difference between that hundred dollar bill and this one? Monopoly money. This one, okay granted, that one does have a little higher quality paper and ink. If you ran both of them through the wash in your pockets, that one would probably survive and this one would be a, a wadded mess. So it's a little higher quality, but still, is it 100 times? No, it's not $100. It's just a piece of paper that law says we must accept. That's it. Now, if you've ever played the game of Monopoly, you understand that during the game of Monopoly, the laws or rules of the game of Monopoly give this $100 bill real value, doesn't it? As long as you're playing the game of Monopoly, the rules or laws of the game give this real value. Therefore, this is also fiat money, isn't it? Based on the laws of the game, a Monopoly dollar has real value. And once you're done playing Monopoly, the game is over, then this reverts back to just being a piece of paper, and that's it. Exactly the same as when the Federal Reserve game is over, that $100 bill will have no real value either. 
it'll revert back to its intrinsic value, which is just a piece of paper. And that's it. So really, there is very little difference between the two. And interestingly, this one is monopoly money, and that one is monopoly money as well. The Federal Reserve has a monopoly on our monetary system. We'll get into, in a few minutes, the dangers of a money monopoly. But first, where do we go off course? Clearly, what we're doing today is not constitutional money. We are not following the Constitution. There is no state in the Union that's accepting only gold and silver coin. Congress is not coining money for us in gold and silver for us to have a money supply. We're clearly off course. Now, Chief Justice John Marshall is often looked at as this great conservative Chief Justice. He really wasn't. He did get a few things right once in a while, but he also did many things that were damaging to a proper interpretation of the Constitution. But here to start off with, he says, among the enumerated powers, we do not find that of establishing a bank, a central national banking system. Is he right? He's right. There is no enumerated power in the Constitution giving the federal government power to establish a national banking system. He's exactly right. But then he goes on to counter himself in a way by saying that because it does not expressly prohibit one, we can go ahead and do it anyway, because it didn't say we couldn't. Remember back to lecture two when we talked about the enumerated powers, and I used the example of the automobile. You take your car into the auto shop, they do all kinds of work on it that you didn't authorize, and you say, How, what gave you the idea you could do that? And they said, you didn't say we couldn't. That doesn't work, does it? They don't have to expressly prohibit powers to the federal government. If it's not granted, they cannot do it. Just to reemphasize that point. Now, fast forward a little bit. What they did do is establish a Bank of the United States under Alexander Hamilton. He pushed for that. It eventually lost its charter. Congress did not renew it. But eventually they did reestablish the second Bank of the United States. The second Bank of the United States had its charter come up for renewal during the term of presidency of President Andrew Jackson. And Congress passed it, passed the renewal of the charter, and Andrew Jackson stood firmly against renewing the charter of this national bank. He felt they were a terrible threat to our prosperity and our liberty. In fact, he gave a, a speech that I can't help but share just a little bit of it. Speaking against this renewal, he says, Gentlemen, I too have been a close observer of the doings of the Bank of the United States. I have had men watching you for a long time. And I am convinced that you have used the funds of the bank, meaning our national money, to speculate in the breadstuffs of the country. They're using our money for their own personal investments. It gets better. He says, when you won, you divided the profits amongst yourselves. But when you lost, you charged it to the bank, which then charges it to we the people. You tell me that if I take the deposits of the bank and annul its charter, I shall ruin 10,000 families. That may be true, gentlemen, but that is your sin. Should I let you go on, you will ruin 50,000 families, and that would be my sin. You are a den of vipers and thieves, and I have determined to rout you out, and by the eternal, and he pounds his fist down, I will rout you out. You can just feel the fire in that speech. I'd love to have someone leading our country with that kind of passion for overturning such evil powers. And so he went on to veto the renewal of the charter of the second bank in the United States. This is a political cartoon from that day depicting him taking on this den of vipers and thieves, as he called them, and perhaps one of his aides here trying to hold him back from in his zeal, rushing headlong and getting destroyed by them. Anyway, great passion. Whether you admire Andrew Jackson or think ill of him or whatever, the one thing he wished to be remembered for he considered the greatest achievement of his life was he shut down the Second Bank of the United States. I would agree with him. That was the greatest accomplishment of his life. So we fast forward now. We've got to establish a bank again, right? We come up to 1913 with yet another attempt at a central banking system. And one of the promises, one of the campaign propaganda of why it was so essential that we must have a central banking system was this. This is a chart of 250 years of history of inflation. 
starting in 1665 on the far end there. And you'll notice that as we get up to 1776 here, there's a little blip of inflation to help fund the war. They were printing and printing those continental dollars. As we get to the War of 1812, we again went into debt for the war. But you'll notice after each one of those blips upward to pay for a war, they paid off the debts and the inflation goes back down. We get to the Civil War where Lincoln was printing his greenbacks. And again, paper money created a bunch of debt, but they did pay them back out of existence. They spent them out of circulation and paid off the debts. So each time we went into debt, and you see the inflationary curve go back down as they paid off. And we get up to 1913, there's virtually no cumulative inflation over 250 years. But because of this rampant, out of control inflation, as they would call it, we must rein in the inflation by establishing a national bank, the Federal Reserve. So let me demonstrate for you what controlled inflation looks like. There, now we have inflation perfectly under control. And that may sound like I'm teasing here, but the only question is, to whose benefit? If it were to the benefit of the American people, it would continue flat. But if it's to the benefit of those who are running the Federal Reserve, then that's what it should look like. Because they are profiting from our dollar's loss. We'll describe that a little more in depth. First of all, some of you may be familiar with the famous economist John Maynard Keynes, known for Keynesian economic theory. He's a famous British socialist, Marxist, very much the opposite of a free market economist. He was in favor of government intervention into the marketplace, that we must control the markets and have all kinds of power over the markets. He strongly advocated for things like a Federal Reserve to be able to have the power to flood the market with money and retract the money at any time they wanted to, to control and to manipulate the markets. In his book, Economic Consequences of the Peace, published in 1920, he gives us this very startling admittance. He says, by a continuous process of inflation, continuous process of inflation, is that what we're looking at right here? Okay, this is what he's talking about. By a continuous process of inflation, a la the Federal Reserve, by this continuous process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobserved an important part of the wealth of their citizens in a manner that not one man in a million can diagnose. Think about what he's saying there. If you have the power of inflation in the hands of government, they can confiscate your wealth secretly in a way that not one man in a million can diagnose. I sum this up in three words. The power of inflation is the power to rob you blind. Isn't that right? The power to control inflation is the power to rob you blind. Now, I was sharing this with someone who graduated as a PhD in economics a few years ago. And if you go study economics at most of our universities in the country today, you're taught Keynesian economic theory. So appropriately, this PhD of economics was a Keynesian. And I told them, I have a real problem with Keynesian economic theory. They said, oh, what's that? Keynesian economic theory must necessarily employ the power over inflation in order for it to work. And this quote clearly demonstrates the dangers of that power. As I shared this quote with them, they responded and said, oh, you're taking that quote out of context. Okay, I could be wrong. Please enlighten me. I, I would love to hear a different take on this because right now I feel it's pretty bad. And the response to me was, well, that wasn't even Mr. Keynes saying it. He was quoting Lenin. John Lennon? Oh, no, no, Vladimir. Okay. You mean the communist? Thank you. You've made my point even better. That doesn't help your case. Lenin is telling us how powerful the power of inflation is at controlling your people. One of the key tenets of Marxism is what? the destruction of private property, the confiscation of private property and total control of it. Well, this is a vital tool in that process, isn't it? I guess it shouldn't be too surprising. John Maynard Keynes is a socialist himself, advocating principles of Marxism. But nonetheless, that is a power that I feel no man should be trusted with. 
Now, another prominent economist that you might be familiar with is Alan Greenspan. Back before he became involved with the Federal Reserve, he wrote very much in favor of gold and silver currency. One of those statements, he says, in the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. Notice those last three words I've highlighted. He's equating inflation, confiscation through inflation. He's saying inflation is confiscation, isn't he? Well, that validates what Mr. Well, Lenin actually had said. That the power to inflate is the power to rob you blind. Second opinion. Now, as we jump into the definition of inflation itself, we've often been told inflation is rising prices. That is false. That is a symptom of inflation. Inflation is the increase of the money supply. We'll demonstrate that in just a moment. But first, another prominent free market economist, Milton Friedman, gave us this definition. He says, inflation is taxation without legislation. In other words, even without Congress raising taxes, they can continue to tax you more and more just through the back door, through inflation. Another brilliant definition of inflation comes from James Madison. Speaking before the Virginia Assembly in 1786, he declared that inflation affects property without trial by jury. Well, that one surprised me. I'd never thought of that before. But when we lose our property through inflation, a few years later, that was protected in the Fifth Amendment that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law and trial by jury. What he's saying is that inflation violates the Fifth Amendment by confiscating your property without trial by jury. Astounding. Absolutely brilliant. Okay. Now, for just a moment, we're going to take the room and we're going to do a little role play. I want you to all imagine that we live in an isolated island. We're totally independent of the rest of the world. We're our own little economy. And on this island, we're all farmers. We have our horse-drawn plows and we go out and plow our field. And I'll play the role of the banker. In this community, I'm your banker. And because the farming life has its ups and downs, very benevolently of me, I've given each of you a loan for $100 just to help smooth things out. And I'm the only source of money on this island, by the way. So all money in circulation has been loaned to you from me. Now, Ryan here is a little, he's a brilliant inventor. And one day he comes out before the community and displays for everyone his newest invention. He calls it a tractor. And he demonstrates for all of us that with his tractor, we can plow a week's worth of field in less than one day. Now, who wants to bid for his tractor? He puts it up for auction. And the bidding starts, 10, 20, 50, 80. No one has more than $100, so you know it's not going beyond 100, right? Let's say the bidding stops at $100. Tractor is sold. Well, before we sell the tractor, I come along. I'm, the, again, the benevolent banker. And I personally, I feel like some of you are in need of a little help. Some of the farmers on our island are a little less motivated. They don't get up at the crack of dawn, they get up at the crack of noon. And the more lazy among us are struggling appropriately and need some help. They need a bailout. Yeah, that's it. And so I give the lazy segment of our society a bailout by giving you an additional loan of, now you have $10,000 loan from me instead of 100. Those that were the hardworking only have $100, but those that are the lazy ones have $10,000. Now, who gets the tractor? One of the lazier ones of society, right? What does it sell for? Potentially, it could sell all the way up to, if there's enough people bidding against each other, it could go up to and not pass $10,000. If the tractor was about to sell for $100 until I intervened, and now it sells for $10,000, what just happened to our tractor? That's a hundred times more purchase price. Is the tractor capable of a hundred times more work? Has our tractor changed at all? The value of our tractor didn't change. The value of our money changed. The tractor didn't go up in value, the money went down in value. Now here's a key. With that little economic bailout that I did, those of you that have a hundred dollars just lost 
99% of your buying power. It's effectively the, as if I came into your home and stole $99 of that 100 and gave it to the lazy segment of society that got the $10,000 loan because the value of their 10,000 came from your 100. That's inflation. That's how an economic bailout to some in society equates with a transfer of wealth from some to others. That's one way of a socialist redistribution of wealth when we do a bailout to one specific segment of society. Brilliant, but there's one more problem in this scenario, and that is I trapped every one of you the moment you signed your loan. Let's, just for the sake of example, let's say the example of the $10,000 loan. The moment you walked out with $10,000 in your pocket from my bank, you have $11,000 owed to me with interest. Simple interest, 10% annually. We'll just keep things simple. So the moment you walked out with 10,000, you owe me 11. Wait a minute, there's not enough money to pay me off, is there? There's not enough money on the entire island to pay off all the debts you owe to me because all of it has interest on top of it. Every dollar in circulation. That $20 bill we spoke about a moment ago is the same way. Every year that that $20 bill is in circulation, we, the people of the United States, pay interest on that $20 bill to the Federal Reserve. As long as it's in circulation. They own it. We just borrowed it. We're paying interest on it. Now, here's the next key. If you don't spend the $10,000, you still have it, but you owe me a payment of $1,000, right, each year? So you pay me $1,000 year after year. How long will that last? Well, 10 years, and you're out of your $10,000. You never spent it. You're just using it up, just paying interest to me. But you still owe me $10,000. You've just spent this on interest payments. You still owe me a loan for $10,000. You have a problem. What do you do? Either I foreclose on you, and I take your farm for having printed some money that was worthless, or I'll be nice to you. I'll give you a second loan. So now you owe me $20,000, and you're paying me $2,000 per year payments. Well, this second loan is only going to last you five payments, isn't it? And five years later, you're out of money again. You're coming back to me saying, can I get a third loan? Sure, go ahead. We'll go up to $30,000 now. Because I first signed you on the line, you're trapped. You need to keep increasing your debt or financial collapse. And this time, $3,000 per year payments only last you three and a third years. Do you notice what's happening? The fourth time you take out this loan, it'll only last you two and a half years. The fifth time, it'll only last you two years. The time that that $10,000 lasts you keeps getting shorter and shorter and shorter, leading to a faster and faster increase in the amount of money in circulation. What are we doing? We're inflating, but we're not only inflating, we're increasing the speed of inflation, which is hyperinflation. You start getting into the exponential growth of the amount of money in circulation, it's hyperinflation. That is the way our national debt to the Federal Reserve works. If we don't keep raising the debt ceiling and taking on more debt from the Federal Reserve, our economy will collapse. They will take all the money out of circulation and we'll still have not paid them off. On the other hand, if we continue down this path, it must inevitably lead to hyperinflation. That's the way our Federal Reserve System was designed. It was designed to hyperinflate. Does anyone know who this founding father was? I, I'm misleading you. He's not really a founding father of our nation. He's a founding father of our monetary system. This is Lord Mayor Amschel Rothschild. He's the father of the Rothschild brothers who established the Rothschild banking dynasty of Europe. He also had a major amount of influence on the establishment of our banking system, the Federal Reserve. Their family mantra was this, let us control the money of a nation and we care not who makes its laws. Why is that? Well, this reminds me of the other golden rule. You all know the golden rule, but do you know the other golden rule? He who has the gold makes the rules. That's what he's saying here, isn't it? I don't care who runs the country. If I control the money, I control that country. Let me demonstrate one example of that. Some of you might remember the TARP bill, the Troubled Asset Relief Program that was to, put, to bail out all these banks that were collapsing that we were told were too big to fail. And all the 
scare tactics of if we don't bail them out, it'll lead to financial Armageddon and all the markets will totally collapse and so we must bail out these banks and anyway, whatever the case, they finally passed it. But I want to go through the details of it. First of all, it was proposed in Congress, in the House of Representatives, as a $700 billion bailout. Now this was shocking to our nation. $700 billion in one bill proposed by Congress. There's nothing that had ever been close to that amount of money proposed in a single bill. This was huge. And it, appropriately so, led to a massive outcry by the people. They were receiving massive amounts of phone calls into Washington, D.C., as well as letters, faxes, emails, and so on. Please do not pass this TARP bill. And Congress listened. The House of Representatives shot down the $700 billion TARP bill. Hooray! And then the Senate came up with their version. They added about another $150 billion of bribes. $850 total bill, roughly, and that one passed the Senate. They sent that over to the House. The House looked at that and said, oh, that looks much better, and they passed it as well. That's how the TARP bill went, in a nutshell. But remember the first stage of that when Congress shot down the $700 billion one in the House? When I was celebrating that it looked like the TARP bill was dead, a friend of mine sent me an email saying, you might want to check out today's report on the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis reporting website. I went there and I found this chart and I was shocked. This is a chart reporting the amount of money in circulation as reported by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. National though. And you see this nice gradual growth until the very week that Congress said no to the TARP bill, suddenly they created 900 billion new dollars. Looks a little suspicious. Very similar to the amount that was finally approved by Congress a few weeks later. Now call me crazy, but that looks suspiciously as if the Federal Reserve was moving forward with the TARP bill even before it had passed Congress. Now that may have seemed crazy at the time, but I have proof now. Let's first start into where the TARP bill money was spent. Remember it passed as $850 billion. And as we start digging into where some of that money has gone, we find BNP Paribas, a bank out of France, received $175 billion of it. That's a massive amount of money of our $850 to go across to foreign shores. And the next one on the list, Bank of Scotland, yet another foreign bank, getting $181 billion. Lehman Brothers, hey, at least they're local, right? $183 billion. Unfortunately, that investment, uh, they, they still went bankrupt. <laughs> Good investment there. The next one we find on the list is another foreign bank, $262 billion. Another Switzerland bank, $287. Deutsche Bank in Germany, $354 and J.P. Morgan Chase getting 391. If your math is quick, you're starting to notice we're already running out of money, but they keep going. Royal Bank of Scotland gets 541 billion. Goldman Sachs themselves got almost the entire bill of 814. Bear Stearns, 853, they exceeded the amount allowed by Congress. Barclays got 868. Bank of America, 1.34 trillion now with a T. And Merrill Lynch, 1.95, Morgan Stanley, 2.04 trillion, and our final biggest recipient, Citigroup, at two and a half trillion dollars of an $850 billion TARP bill. Something's wrong here. In fact, the total comes out to over 16 trillion, and the subtle little detail I didn't tell you is not, not one penny of this is the actual 850 allowed by TARP. All of this is in addition to the $850 billion authorized by TARP. This is what the Federal Reserve decided to do on their own under the table. The only reason we know this is that for years, Congressman Ron Paul has been pushing for an audit of the Federal Reserve. Finally, they passed an audit bill. It was terribly watered down from his original bill and it ended up being only a partial audit. But from a partial audit, we have uncovered the greatest financial crime in the history of mankind, the handing of our U.S. dollars mostly to foreign banks in an amount larger than our, our entire national debt. Now, this was 
published in our magazine's website, thenewamerican.com, July of 2011. It was a report on the Government Accountability Audit of the Federal Reserve. And how many of you saw this in the mainstream news? They never touched it. In fact, after I saw it on our magazine website, I searched the internet and I found probably two or three other places anywhere on the internet that even mentioned it. This is the greatest financial crime in the history of the world, the biggest news of the century, and it got no press. Now that should be a clue that if the media you're listening to didn't cover this, they probably didn't want you to know. And you should probably be a little suspect of their motives. Just a side note. Now, the next thing I want to point out, here's the article that came out in our magazine's website. The title is Fed Audit, Trillions for Foreign Banks, as we pointed out, and Conflicts of Interests. The Conflicts of Interest part they point to is, right here at the bottom it says, for example, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, which on this previous slide received $391 billion, the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase was on the Federal Reserve Board voting for it. He voted for himself to get this bailout. Does that sound like a conflict of interest to you? If ever there was one, that was one. Anyway, so they discovered that starting in the end of 2007, the Federal Reserve, over the period of two and a half years, had provided over 16 trillion secret bailouts. And since this article was published, they've continued to uncover trillions more. We don't know the total anymore. Shocking power. It really comes down to this statement by John McManus, president of the John Birch Society. He's well known for very concise statements that are full of meaning. Here's one of his best ones. He says, when you give someone the power to inflate, he will. It's really that simple. There has never been in the history of mankind someone entrusted with this power to print money, power of inflation, that did not abuse it. We've never found a way to restrain that from happening. Well, then, logically, the only simple solution is don't give that power to anyone. No one should have the power to inflate. Now, I want to go to a little, little definition of what is the Federal Reserve. There have been many myths perpetrated throughout the history of the Federal Reserve on what they really are. From They're really a fourth branch of the federal government. Well, as I look through the U.S. Constitution, I find Article 1, Congress, Article 2, the Executive Branch, President, Article 3, Judiciary. There is no fourth branch established by the Constitution, so it couldn't be that. They've even perpetrated the myth that uh, they're really a branch of the Executive Department. That, that's what they are. However, a few years ago, Bloomberg Press was under the Freedom of Information Act, wanting to find out where some of the Federal Reserve money had been spent. And they went to court over it. And here's some of the defense of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York Board of Governors is the steering portion of the entire Federal Reserve. That's the head, you could say. And in an attempt to avoid transparency, saying that we are not subject to Freedom of Information Act requests because we're not a government agency, they start to tell us the very contrary to what they've always said. For example, they say that the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is not an establishment of the executive branch, contrary to what we've been telling you up till now, because it's a corporation whose stock is privately held. By the bankers. By the bankers, such as the CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase being on the board and, anyway, conflict of interest there. He also points out that it is overseen by a board of directors, the majority of whom are privately appointed. Only the chairman. Ben Bernanke, Alan Greenspan, or whoever else, has anything to do with the president selecting and influencing who that will be. But for the most part, it is run by them in their own control, by those who are the stockholders. And none of the stock of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is government owned. It is a private corporation for profit, and every dollar we have ever borrowed from them, we pay them interest every year to a private group of people receiving this massive amount of money from us. In fact, it was during the Reagan administration when he was searching for areas where they could cut the budget and trim waste, they discovered in what was reported called the Grace Commission Report 
that 100% of the federal income tax collected by the IRS is spent just paying the interest on our national debt. None of it funds what the federal government does. Nothing. And the majority of that national debt is owed to the Federal Reserve. Interesting. Now, our conclusion on this slide, the Federal Reserve is not actually federal at all, and they're not even a reserve. But otherwise, the name fits perfectly. <laughs> it's no wonder that Thomas Jefferson warned us. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. Now, his generation clearly understood the dangers of standing armies. They'd experienced it firsthand. This is the only thing he feared more. And you can see why. In the early 70s, there was a man who won a Nobel Prize. He was an Austrian School of Economics economist by the name of Friedrich A. Hayek. He won a Nobel Prize for proving that the major cause of our economic boom-bust cycle is our Federal Reserve flooding the market with cheap and easy money and then shutting off the spout of that free money. When they flood the market with that money, such as when they flooded the market with cheap and easy money during our dot-com boom and our real estate boom, where it was said that if you could fog a mirror, you could probably get a loan. And then shortly thereafter, they tightened things up again and it was harder to come by, and that led to the inevitable collapse, the bust that we are now in. That is, at its very root, the cause of our current economic recession. As Mr. Hayek pointed out in his Nobel Prize winning article, the flood of money and the retraction of money causes the massive boom-bust cycles. Now, I point this out because Thomas Jefferson said almost exactly the same thing about 200 years before him, where he says, if the American people ever allow the private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, there's the boom cycle, then by deflation, the bust cycle, the banks and corporations that will grow up around the banks will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Sounds like he's predicting foreclosures as well, isn't he? And we've definitely seen that. His solution, the issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. That is the only solution. Interestingly, as we read about the Federal Reserve Act of 1913, we find that solution in there. First of all, the very first part of the Federal Reserve Act starts out with this statement that it is an act to provide for the establishment of Federal Reserve banks to furnish an elastic currency. The purpose of establishing the Federal Reserve Bank was inflation, to establish an elastic currency where we could expand and retract the supply of money at any time. For that reason, when people talk about reforming the Federal Reserve, I say, it's rotten to the core. Its very foundational principle is a power that no person should be entrusted with, the power of inflation. Now, the very concluding line, Section 30, says this. Congress writing this bill saw some potential problems, and so they said, the right to amend, alter, or repeal this act is hereby expressly reserved. They reserved themselves the power to shut them down, and rightly so. It is time to end the Federal Reserve. It must be done carefully because the Federal Reserve is very much the heart of our economy. And when someone has a bad heart, you don't just remove the heart. It's a very delicate process. It must be done very carefully. But there are very wise proposals on how we can effectively hook our economy up to a life support system, per se, and remove and replace this heart of our economy with one that is more stable, one that doesn't hyperinflate eventually and that must be based on gold and silver. We'll go into some possible discussions on that in the group discussion after the video, but for now we'll end with that. Thank you very much for joining us today.